Well, I was born in a university town. My parents were, had not had much education. And my father owned a grocery store, not as big as this room. But um, I went to a school in the worst part of the city, so that by the time I was 10 years old, I was the only white boy in the school. This was a very valuable education because I learned how to get into any building I wanted. And where most of my friends wanted to get into the candy store or the toy store, I wanted to get into the university. So from the time I was 10 years old, I was sneaking into the university where the professors thought I was the son of a graduate student, and the graduate students thought I was the son of a professor and I could do what I wanted. And I thought I would become a university professor, that I would be a professor of Greek or Sanskrit. And this is what I studied in university. And the Holy Spirit had another idea for me, that I should do this with avant-garde film. And, you know, I resisted, but I ended up traveling with films and writing about films. And then I, uh, when I was 25, Anthology Film Archives was founded, and I was made the director. And I was very bad at it. I had no talent to be the director of an organization. So I said no, and I stepped down, and I became director of the library and of the publications. And it was just at that time that universities in America started teaching film. And I was invited to teach film, and I did it part-time for a while, and I ended up doing it full-time for 50 years. And I did not believe in teaching film. So I hated it and I quit because the people who studied film knew nothing. They hadn't read Homer, they hadn't read Dante, they, they just knew about films. So I said I, I quit and just about the same time my first marriage ended, I was very poor. I was living in New York in a tiny apartment and I didn't even have electricity. I couldn't pay for electricity. So someone said that there's a film job teaching at Princeton University for one year. I accepted it. And I went and taught there and um, they liked me. They liked me because I was funny. You know, the, the students thought it was, the films I, I liked were crazy, but I was very funny. So they, liked me. they kept me another year and another year. And it, in all, I was in that place for 35 years. And eventually, I became so disgusted with the film student. Oh, also, I made a condition. I will not teach in any place that has a film department. And although my colleagues wanted there to be film studies, I fought it as long as I was there. Now that I'm gone, they're going to do it. And eventually, I also taught not just film, but what they call great books, that is Homer to Dante, Machiavelli to Nietzsche, much better students, much more serious, and so on. The only good thing about teaching was that every time I taught a film, I would have to have new ideas about it. Um, but uh, I don't like what has become of the academic world. Students are concerned with getting grades, with making money. And halfway through my teaching, the computer was invented, and this destroyed education because they no longer learned to write, they learned to word process. They'd write something, and the computer would tell them to change the sentence or change the spelling. It was terrible. And their parents could call them every day. And the parents interfered with, you know, what are you learning? Don't take that course because there's no money from it. Take this. So. One thing I insisted on, I never showed a digital film. So I always I insisted that they project films. And when a film was unavailable anymore, I showed a different film. Now they no longer project any real films in my university, only digital.
Digital is excellent for the, if you show the film, like if I would show a film in 35 millimeter, the next day in class, I would come with digital to show a particular scene so we could talk about it. That's very useful. But to see, to have the experience of, is, is I mean, people, it's like having, uh, seeing art by looking at your furniture. Who has, who looks at the furniture for art? And they get very bad habits. The students grow up, if they want to have a beer, they stop it and they go have a beer. If they want to take a piss, they stop it and take a piss. Or they, someone calls on the telephone and they leave and they watch the rest the next day. That's not an experience of film. I mean, what are you going to do with an Andy Warhol film if you can go have a beer and take a piss and go out? I mean, you know, there you are, you're stuck for eight hours looking at a man sleeping. You don't want to look at him for 15 minutes every three days. You know, in the, when I was a student of Greek and Sanskrit, we had wonderful old professors who were very dull. They would come in and they would look at a paper and they would mumble about a word. They were wonderful. These people can no longer get jobs anymore. Well, you have to be a stand-up comedian like I am in order to get a job. I mean, uh, and, and students choose courses based on whether they're entertaining or not. Crazy. Well, I've been amused, I've been director of a, of a, the word curator has become perverted. A curator in a museum used to be the person who physically took care of the permanent collection. Now, everybody with a computer who doesn't know how to write is a curator. It means that they make up a list of something and and so this I never was. I was a, uh, I, I worked at Anthology Film Archives, but I don't consider myself a curator. I was a writer. In the 1950s, the only way interesting films were shown were by putting them on a program that was harmless. In other words, there'd be a cartoon, and a documentary, and then one difficult film, and then a funny film. And Jonas Mekas said this was terrible. What we should do is simply show the films of a, one filmmaker and show them in chronological order. So if you want to call that curating, this was the great revolution. And this went on for 30 years. And then when the computer came and people forgot how to write, and forgot how to think, then a whole new generation of people came who tried to make the programs entertaining or thought of themselves as artists by putting one film next to another. They're very tedious. Yes, an archive is a very important thing. People have to learn how to, how to uh, handle the original film and how to look for the qualities of the original film, how to care for the original film. Now, if, you, if, you're cur if your curating program is based upon the principle of always showing original films and always putting the artist first and never trying to entertain an audience, wonderful. If you think every teacher is a curator because they make a curriculum, then I'm a curator. But I, I, I just have a, a certain idea and I will illustrate the idea with the films or I'll show certain historical principles. Yes, that, that is very important to be able to think of things and, and show, but that's not the same as entertaining one's students or entertaining an audience. Entertaining an audience is a sin. When I first began, there were very few film archives and very little film preservation. Um, and the great di film director, uh, film archive director Jacques Ledoux of the great uh, Cinémathèque Royale de Belgique uh, came to me and he said, we are preserving film and we would like you to select the most difficult film you can imagine to preserve because we want to train our people to do very, and I said, oh, you should take some hand-painted films by Marie Mencken and Harry Smith because it's 
very hard to get the, the quality of the paint. And that, that seemed to me a very good idea, that one of the things that, that happens in uh, film preservation is very difficult. For instance, there are many silent films that it's very difficult to know what they originally were like because the ratio of the image changed when sound came on and most of the prints are sound ratio. And so we want to, it isn't good enough just to make the, the image from the sound ratio big to fit. You must find film prints from before sound that have all of the visual material and print it without the sound track. One of the great horrors in film presentation is to put a piano in the room. This is an incredible idiocy because originally, if a film was serious and in a big city, there, there was an orchestra, and not just an orchestra, there was a machine that had the score go for the conductor controlled at the same pace as the film, with marks for the film. But after 1930, musicians had unions, and musicians had to be paid decently. So no theaters had orchestras aside from opera houses. So instead, they bring some stupid piano player in to make tinkling noises, and people are nostalgic for that. And, in, and they show great silent films. They show Potemkin or they show Vertov with some idiot pianist in the room. This is insane. So you must, students must learn to be historians and, and not tolerate this shit anymore. And the audience will not come because they want to see the piano player and they want to have, have fun at the films. Art has nothing to do with fun and nothing to do with democracy. Democracy is very good to protect you against tyranny, but it is terrible for art. You should pray. You should go and light a candle in church and hope you get the right students. There is no criteria. You cannot tell what a young person... First of all, why does a person want to make music? Why does a person want to make painting? Why does a person want to make film? It's because they've already seen. They've already heard some music. Nobody, nobody ever woke up the morning and said, I think I should invent some things that make sound and some should have strings and some should have wood and some should have brass. Nobody ever did, they heard music. So everybody becomes an artist because of the artist they all, art they already saw. And in our society, it's very hard to see anything but crap, especially in film. Most people have only seen films, so they, they want to make what they saw in the theater. And so the, the people who most want to make films are the ones who at least should make films. It's those who, when they suddenly see something that is really original, they say, ah, that's very, who, and th there's no way to predict that. Uh, what I really am good at, they don't need, which is the interpreting certain films that already exist. This is not for curating, but you know, a certain level of scholarship. But the problem is, that very few students have read enough or seen enough to be able to take advantage of it. Um, uh, many years ago, I, I, I wrote a book on Italian film, and I could talk in Italy about some things because all of the gymnasium students in Italy have read Dante. So one can talk about Dante, but you can't do that in the United States. I probably couldn't do it in Spain. Um, so, you know, it's a serious film scholarship. It, it's interesting. I began thinking I would be a professor of Greek or Sanskrit, and I end up teaching film as if it were Greek or Sanskrit. As many people can understand what I'm talking about as could take a Sanskrit class.